Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. When I was in my uh, 20s, I lived in Israel. It was another really difficult time uh, for Israel. It was the second intifada, and there were, uh, there were buses exploding in Jerusalem every week at that point. It was very, very tense. On the winter break, um, I decided to go on a little vacation, and I went to the Sinai Desert in Egypt, where if you've been, uh, there are many Israelis there, but there are also travelers from all over the world. Um, it was before I'd ever been to Chicago or knew much about Chicago, but meeting all these different people there, I met a group of young Palestinian Americans who were from Chicago. Um, and I remember wondering how our interaction would go when they found out I was an Israeli Jew, um, but it was very surprising. And one of their party was their cousin who was from Nablus, an Israeli, an Israeli Arab. And he said excitedly, oh, I live there too. Um, and somehow I felt like such a sense of closeness at that moment with him, but with really with that whole, with that group. And then somehow we were, there was some kind of connection that we were all young people who were embroiled in a conflict that most other young people in the world were not. Um, and sharing some kind of burden and living on the same land and really from a society that somehow felt not so different, not so different from each other when there are people there from all over the world, all these other different places. And it was just when, uh, maybe it was also because it was neutral territory, but it was just when Israel was building the wall, the separation fence um, to prevent suicide bombers from entering into Israel. I remember having a thought, and my thought was, one day, one day, young people of both societies are going to come together and tear down this wall. And so through the years um, after that, uh, in and out of Israel, but I was involved in all kinds of peace initiatives, sometimes in Israel, sometimes even going to the West Bank. And I always came from a place of very strong holding on to the Israeli narrative, but always open to dialogue. Um, and it had powerful moments and it had depressing moments. And sometimes when it seemed it was possible and close and many times where I felt this will never ever come to be, peace will never happen. But I always held on to that thought that we come from a similar place at the very root of it all. And I think even in this moment, even in this moment with everything that's happening now, we have to still believe in peace. Right, the prophet Isaiah, one of our, probably our greatest prophet, prophesied, except for Moses, prophesied at a time when Israel's enemies were completely surrounding Jerusalem. The Babylonians were all around, sometimes in siege, other times this Jerusalem was all by itself. And yet, even in that place, Isaiah prophesied, the leper, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard lie down with the kid the calf, the beast of prey, and the fatling together with a little boy to herd them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion like the ox shall eat straw. A babe shall play over a viper's hole, an infant pass its hand over a, a, a snake's den. And all my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done, for the land shall be filled with devotion to God as water covers the sea. Such a beautiful prophecy, and it seems so very far away right now the hope so barely there, sometimes wondering, does the other side even want peace? But we have to hold on to the vision and also to the vision of our Parsha this week. Because our Parsha this week, just fitting the situation perfectly, is that of the uh, Noah's Ark. When the whole world, the primordial world, goes into a state of violence and lawlessness, and God just loses hope completely in human beings and in all life and just says, I'm going to press the reset button, reboot. And we know the story. He commands Noah to build the ark and the waters fall and engulfs the whole world. And eventually all of life dies except for Noah and what's in the ark. And then the rains do finally stop and the water recedes. And one day Noah sends out the raven and then the dove and it returns with an olive branch. This is the tradition um, to indicate that land was back. And so they leave the ark and humanity begins again. 
And God speaks to Noah and promises he will never destroy the world again. And so a rainbow appears as a covenant, as a sign of God's promise that peace, um, peace is really the ultimate fate of the world. And part of it too of this whole parasha is this lesson that just one righteous person can be that person who helps bring that world. And at this moments like this, we really have to hold on to the promise of the rainbow and that God will make it right and the people will be okay. And there are good people and there are not so good people and there are really not so good people. And our task is to keep believing in the good people too, that they can emerge from anywhere and can turn the corner in a moment that's just as surprising as the most lethal attack that also comes in surprise against us. And it's our duty to believe in them and to believe in peace as well. And even as we go to war, even as we go to war, at any moment you will find those people who will believe in tearing down walls and then planting the seeds that will become the olive trees. The dove will bring to an open window where others will receive it and know that the waters have receded and they're ready for peace. And then in all of my sacred mount, nothing evil or vile shall be done for the land shall be filled with devotion to God as water covers the sea. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.